Hi, and welcome to Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast, highlighting artists, teachers, authors, and philanthropists of the regenerative movement, people who are committed to and showcase qualities of planetary leadership. My name is Julian Guderlei. I'm committed to a world that allows all people to thrive. I'm your host and creator of Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast. And in today's episode, I get to feature David Bronner and Gero Lesson. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for yeah. having us. Brilliant. Absolutely. Gary Lason is Vice President of Special Operations at Dr. Bronner's and David Bronner is the CEO, aka Cosmic Engagement Officer for Dr. Bronner's. I'm looking forward to a diverse conversation with both of you about the massive success story of Dr. Bronner's. David, you grew the company from 4 million in revenue in 1998 to over 129 million in annual revenue in 2019. And Gero, you just published a book, or you're about to publish a book called Honor Thy Label, which comes out in March 2021. And I'm sure we'll get to talk about regenerative organic agriculture, industry cooperation on clean supply chains, fair trade, and the example that Dr. Bronner's is making in, in the world. Uh, so again, with these words, welcome, you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Where shall we start? Maybe, maybe we, we'll, we'll go right into regenerative organic agriculture. David, I know that you and a team of people have worked on this over the last year to create a new certified label that helps people to understand that uh, agriculture isn't just organic, but also regenerative. Yeah, so yeah, the Regenerative Organic Certification Standard, ROC, um, uh, and the, the organization is the Regenerative Organic Alliance. Basically, it's a culmination of 20 years of work, which Gerald has been really spearheading uh, in, in our organization. Um, but, you know, it's when I came into the company and, 97 and had to step up early when my dad died in 98. Um, you know, there's a, you know, really appreciated that our, uh, you know, soaps were very clean relative to most uh, quote unquote liquid soaps on the market that are generally not natural soaps or, or synthetic surfactant products. Um, but nonetheless, realizing that we were just buying our olive oil or coconut oil or min oils on price and spec from brokers, just like everybody else does and had no real awareness or visibility into the supply chain and the, the environmental and social conditions under which our major ingredients were being produced. And, uh, you know, so, so we first committed to going organic under the USDA organic program and our soaps uh, and, and our entire line is pretty much certified under the same organic program that certifies food. But realizing that organic uh, you know, while important is mostly about what you shouldn't do. It's, you know, it's like, you know, don't use synthetic pesticides, don't use synthetic fertility. Um, but it doesn't say, it doesn't mandate what you should be doing. And there's a lot of, which to say, you know, less than great organic operations that are basically, Gerald's phrase is organic by neglect. Uh, you know, they're just not doing anything to, to, to responsibly manage their, their farm. And furthermore, organic has no social, there's no, no social component. So, uh, you know, here in California, you, you know, we have a real systemic problem in, in the U.S. generally of, of exploited uh, farm workers. And it's not like, you know, farm workers, you know, getting a better wage or better conditions moving from a conventional to an organic field. There, there's just no criteria and generally it's, there's just no, no better working conditions or wages. So we realized that we really needed to establish direct trading relationships with the farmers that are producing our major raw materials. And so that led us on a big adventure that, you know, maybe I'll just let Gero uh, talk a little about um, with, with, with each of our supply chains um, and, you know, really committing to uh, both social and environmental sustainability. And on the social side, that translates to fair trade certification. So third, third party fair trade certification, you know, making sure that uh, prices being paid to farmers are fair enabling them to have a you know, good livelihood to care of their workers and their land in a responsible, regenerative way, um, you know, guarantees a, a floor price that is negotiated. Daryl can go into that a little more to make sure if market prices collapse, uh, they're, they're not, you know, shit out, shit out of luck, yeah. uh, you know, so, um, and then on the organic side, we realize that, I mean, it's almost as, as much of a social as an environmental benefit when you take care of your land in a regenerative way. And, and, and again, I'll defer to Gerald here to really go into details on, on all the different regenerative practices that we've implemented in partnership with our farmers. Um, you know, not only are you regenerating the land, but you're actually boosting yields and income substantially. Um, 
So, and then, you know, the third component here, not, not, not in our own supply chains, but I've been a vegan since 1996 and really um, cognizant of the disaster of animal agriculture on the planet. Mm. Um, you know, we have these huge factory farms with confined animal feeding operations where animals are locked up in cages in horrific conditions and force fed grain that they didn't evolve to eat. You know, GMO soy and corn, these huge monocultures that, you know, cover much of the U.S., uh, it was just feed grain, you know, pouring in these animals. And there's so much synthetic nitrogen, uh, you know, fertilizer going in and, and herbicide. These crops are engineered to resist huge amounts of weed killer. Um, and then the factory farms themselves. And, you know, it's just so energy intensive and, and you're destroying yeah. the soil and everything's being disrupted. Um, but so the animal welfare component is, is hugely imp important. So Regenerative Organic Certified is basically taking the best of the animal welfare, uh, fair labor, and regenerative uh, soil movements into a single standard. So basically um, it's, it's a standard that mandates, you know, what you should be doing in your farm, in your farming practice. And, you know, not simply not using synthetic pesticides or fertilizers, but actually doing cover cropping and, you know, intercropping with complementary uh, tree species or diverse crop rotations and perimeter plantings for, for pollinators and, and predator insects. and you know, just doing, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then on the livestock side, yeah. like pasture based criteria, you know, only for, I don't know how familiar you are with like global animal partnership gap. It's this gap rating system from one to five. So four is where it's pasture based. So only pasture based uh, or, uh, uh, livestock um, methods are allowed. So no, you know, no confined systems, uh, the pigs, the chickens, uh, the cows have to be on grass. You know, a big part of regenerative it, on animal agriculture is, you know, sustainable managed grazing of ruminants, you know, mimicking in the wild how predators would move, uh, you know, herds of ruminants through the landscape so they didn't, weren't overgrazing any one part. And when, when it's done right, and then the land has plenty of time to regenerate in the grass and the ecosystem. And this actually speeds that natural soil microbiota and health and, um, so yeah, so you know, proper animal integration, doing it in, in a correct way, because it's kind of like fire. If you do it right, it's great. If you do it wrong, it's a disaster. And, it's uh, exciting yeah. that you you just you know you jumped in right into quite a bit of detail, and I know Gero will hear will hear even more detail from your side of how those supply chains are encouraged to uh, engage with it. I'm saying it's exciting because you know from the the consumer perspective. Some of those things we might understand or want, but it's 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 quite hard to make a choice all at your place of purchase, understanding what are all the practices that are going on on the other side, right? I mean, uh, a USDA organic certified or you know a bio certified if you if you're in Europe, um, those are at least like the minimum requirements to understand. Okay, there's um, there's something being going on on this farm that is trying to uphold a certain ethical standard or a certain kind of um, healthy standard for soil and food. Um, but it's been lacking. Like, I feel like there was a, a vacuum to, uh, that you guys are now filling with this regenerative organic certified um, that we really understand that we're in, in total interconnection with the places we buy food from. Yeah, it's, it's basically kind of bringing, you know, a, a single standard to rule them all uh, kind of thing, like rather than having like a separate animal welfare and a separate soil health and a separate fair trade certification, it's, it's bringing it all together. And Obviously, it's new, and we don't have a lot of consumer awareness yet. But we we have partners like Patagonia, uh, you know, really really big, really you know, effective marketing companies, also very ethical. So we feel like we will be building consumer awareness around the certification. Yeah, exciting, Gero. What do you what can you add to this? That's um, that's going to help us understand this certification just just oh, a bit just more. A just, just a whole bunch of uh, history and and activities. And I was just thinking when when David was talking, David is talking more about now the close to present situation, really how that standard has evolved since what they were 2016, 17, things got serious because regenerative came on the map. Our own trip just started much earlier. It's really interesting, just, just historically, right? So we, David and I met through the ties of hemp. He was a businessman thinking of using hemp as a hemp oil, as a material in the soap as the first step possibly to have a more responsible supply chain because both of us thought hemp 
not not save the world, right? That's that's a little too much, but it's a it's a crop with great potential in many different ways. So my my side was at the time I was actually I'm a researcher, a, a physicist, and I was working with Canadian hemp companies on the essentially on the composition of the seeds, just a whole range of food quality issues that needed to be addressed. And the, the problem came up that also there's a little bit of THC on hemp seeds. At the time it was, they came mostly from China, the DEA in the United States starting taking offense because people use it as an excuse to explain their positive um, urine test results for marijuana. The industry, the budding industry started seeing there was a problem. David had vision and just saw that there was going to be a clash with the DEA. And we essentially conducted a study that showed with Canadian hemp seeds, the THC levels are so low that there's no concern. And I got this published in a peer reviewed journal. David in the meantime <clears throat> was ready to challenge the DEA who was going to ban all Canadian hemp seeds or hemp foods in general. And it so happened that we won. This was the beginning of a of a of a wonderful friendship, as as they say, right? So this this was the first time that we just did something together. And you don't beat the DEA in court too often, right? It's 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 pretty unique. It's quite the story, it's, yeah. It's quite a story. And there it's were a, a good origination of... point that you guys share there. Well, you, you know, just to jump in, you know, it's it's also that you know Carol says that hemp, uh, you know, it's not the single crop that's going to save the world and. You know, I was a little more on that tip maybe for a little bit and Garrow definitely helped me uh, kind of get over that. But, um, and you know, just realize that, you know, it's great in a lot of ways, but you know, it's not the answer to every single problem we're facing. And, and, but what hemp symbolized was sustainable regenerative agriculture. You know, mm -hmm. it was a symbol for, you know, it's a crop, it grows like a weed. It doesn't need a lot of, you know, synthetic inputs. Um, unfortunately, it's all too often grown in a not great way. And, um, and what we realized, or I, what Gary already knew and I figured out, is it's about the, re the management approach to agriculture, regardless mm -hmm. of the crop. It's not, it wasn't intrinsic to hemp or, or to palm or, or any other crop. It's, it's any, and it's true. This is our origins on agriculture and regenerative really come from our involvement in hemp because, you know, we had the dream mm -hmm. in the 90s. Oh, there's one crop that can just do all kinds of things and it's, it's human. And um, it, it can be local, it's diverse, you know, all these things. And it's, of course, it's grown without pesticides and herbicides and no fertilizer needed. And you can grow all these dreams that didn't quite pan out. But we, we had both, like our friends in hemp, a strong sense that agriculture could be quite different than what it is now, right? That's ultimately, I think, where we, we started. And then, as David said... That's, that's beautiful. You know, just to chime in there for it's, a second, I mean, you know, in Canada, where, where I spend most of my time, where, where cannabis is now legalized entirely, unfortunately, mm -hmm. hemp is grown mostly in, in labs and in like industrial kind of settings, right? No, it's, no, no, Canada was, I, or the, we could talk about, we, we could do a have, we could have another show on this, Julian. I, I happen to know, I, I spent a lot of time in Canada in the 90s, right? Because I was yeah. involved in the development there. And it's a really interesting case history but it's not quite now the the the, the, the quaint you know small fields etc but it's still a crop that is superior to what's done in really big agriculture corn and soil so we still have a liking to it it doesn't solve all the problems but i guess the point is you need to look at all the agriculture it's not a single crop that's going to fix all the problems it's more about how do you do things and i think that that david started and me then he needed to make soap, right? They took over the company. Then the question is, what is what's your raw materials? That, that was the question the Bronners asked themselves, right? So first step is, and, and what's even available that's different from conventional commodities? Well, the first step was USDA organic, because by the time then there were standards and you could actually buy organic coconut oil and palm oil, the Bronner switched, pretty expensive. But after a little while, you realize you don't know anything about your source, right? You just know it's it's organic. You buy it from a broker, and that broker has no clue as to how the stuff is made. And then at the time, I was working in Sri Lanka on development projects, mm -hmm. and we were friends. And David said, Gero, yeah, look around. Is there any fair trade coconut oil? Because the question was, how do you ascertain social conditions on the ground? And fair trade was the only game in town, right? There was a and, and David was obsessed with certifying because 
people just make claims all night and day and say this is the greatest of all but if nobody verifies it no third party it's all bullshit let, let's face it right so and this is where david wanted something certified and that he wanted for the social aspect as well and at that time 2005 we're talking it was only fair trade right david that's probably a fair representation of what drove you guys yeah no i mean third party certification is key and obviously it's you know depends on the program and you know, you know there's the standard itself and then there's how effectively it's actually implemented and followed and and, and certified to um but you know i'd say this, so so what gary was saying in sri lanka this was our first major project of, of co coconut oil is our number one ingredient it's for our liquid soaps what gives the high lather and you know good and hard water conditions um but it's you know it's kind of like the hemp you know what when we realized you know after a while like okay you know hemp hemp was a huge global crop but it really is kind of you know pretty niche and yeah it's coming back and we you know have a passion for it and want to want to help that you realize that oh wait coconut is in many ways like what hemp was purported to be or and used to be which was it's like the dominant crop in sri lanka and it's both a fiber and a, and a nut you know similar to, to, to hemp it's a dual fiber and seed crop and just huge amounts of uses and garo had extensive networks in sri lanka already with coconut um, Garo came into hemp working as on natural fibers as alternatives to synthetic fibers generally. So he already had all this experience in Sri Lanka. And then he, he set up this uh, tsunami relief project. I mean, you know, what, what was Garo doing there in 2004, 2005? It, he, he's, he set up this beautiful project called Second Aid that was uh, doing microloans before that was a thing to, um, to help rebuild fishing boats and, and sewing shops and you know, and that's when I said, hey, Gero, you know, look, you know, we know we need to, you know, start establishing direct trading relationships. You got all these networks and coconut already in Sri Lanka. Let's, let's see what we can do. And it's so, so you get a sense, Julia, this was driven really by the, the intention to take Dr. Bonner's supply chains. It's a, it's a fundamental approach that many big companies have taken, but the branch has said, let's make sure our raw materials that they are clean, environmentally and socially. And there's four, yeah. basically. Coconut oil, palm oil, olive oil, and mint oil. And that's, that's a really nice situation to be in because many other companies have hundreds of ingredients. We just take those four and that covers more of 90%. So let's do those organic and fair trade. Let's start in Sri Lanka. And so the mandate was to build a coconut oil mill. Now, I had never done this before. I knew vaguely what organic how it was structured. I had no experience with the regulatory framework, nor did the Bronners. So the trust that they put into us to just set up a vertically integrated um, structure with what's now 1,200 farmers, a full-scale factory yeah. that, that processes, done by a German architect friend. That, that was just a huge undertaking. And our joke is often, if we had known at that point all the trouble you're going to get into, You'd never have done this, but we just were repeat offenders. We kept doing this and the same thing, Julian, we've done several times and we're still doing it and we're helping others to do that. So it's this concept of setting up a project, a commercial project, no mm -hmm. boutique, commercial project that, in, that gets farmers to improve their, their farm management essentially in an, in an organic way to make sure that the trade relationships with farmers and workers are fair. And then, and then of course, tell the story about it, right? And it feeds into your supply chain and also supplies others. So this is really how we started, but we had no at idea. At the core, you're still at the same energy, right? You're real trailblazers. That's, that's one of the reasons why I got so excited to have this conversation with the two of you, because if we take this out of the regenerative farming context and into a context of um, what does it take to create a thriving world? These certifications and this level of kind of, you know, trailblazing into certifying the, the social, the environmental impacts that we make. Think of the cell phones we all own. Like we, uh, you know, we all just to a degree have become mindless consumers and many of us are, are not so mindless about it anymore, but then you realize, oh, wow, what can we do? Because what needs to be done starts really at, at, at the very beginning, somewhere else across the world, across the planet, where um, it's, it's, it's pretty tough to just trust and believe that uh, everything is going to work out well, right? So, so that trust needs to be built. And yeah. 
It, it has to, and we were just, we had to build this trust and prove it in a non-conventional setting. This was not, you know, the North. We had to go into the jungle in a couple of different locations. And I, I always used to, tra I like traveling. I was not afraid of the jungle. And it, it, it's better this way, but you, the biggest thing is you need to find partners, right? So this was one of the first lessons is to find competent and uh, trustworthy partners, right? That's what I always say. And I was really lucky in Sri Lanka. I had, I had a, a father, son, a daughter team that became our managers and still are. And this was one of the greatest picks. I was really lucky. So back to the regenerative. So we started out, you know, and we thought, okay, this has to be organic, meaning farmers are not supposed to use pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer. That's really simple in Sri Lanka because most farmers in coconut don't use anything. So all you have to do is, and we wanted to accelerate the process. So you go in and you look at how do you ensure that farmers aren't using any agrochemicals while the government keeps a registry and tracks fertilizer issues. So you select all these farmers and then say, okay, you get them certified relatively fast because there's a conversion period, but they already have that. And then you realize those are farmers who don't do anything, right? Mm. They're organic by neglect. And, organic by and neglect. you know what? much of the production of coconut oil worldwide organic is still that way because farmers don't get help in actually changing things now with tree crops you can get away with this because trees just keep producing fruits and as long as they're right. not completely overgrown or there's massive pests you can do that we were so lucky to have a sort we picked a certifier imo swiss certifier and the inspector the local inspector sri lankan raj he was, he was a real fan. He was a practitioner and he said, Gero, organic is not just not doing anything. I want you guys to actually start getting the farmers to improve, which is pruning, not so critical, but mowing, mulching and taking care of the trees, start replanting those. They're all super at the time. Coconut trees in Shrunk all super old. Prices were low. Farmers really didn't didn't care so much. So you had a situation where it all looked really nice and romantic, but there was no productivity. The yields were low, and that's when I got the kick to realize organic is more than this. So you want to do ultimately what you know um, Demeter. You, you know you know the the, the crazy yeah, German the way of Demeter and concept the, the... long time ago. I wasn't up to speed on those, but as a as a scientist, I picked up pretty fast. It's about just replenishing. The, um, the the fertility of the soil to improve its moisture holding capacity to buffer against droughts which are common in Sri Lanka mm. and I was lucky that Sonali and Gordon realized the value of this and so we started doing organic in a way that none of the competitors did but we didn't call it regenerative because the word didn't exist but that whole concept appealed to me Gordon and I loved compost so we set up a composting operation there and started producing compost to issue at a subsidy to the farmers because we thought that is our job as organic you need to promote soil fertility and it's also part of fair trade and that's that's where we really we had to smile about this right fair trade is not just about paying a premium on price you support farmers because mm. it increased yields that gets up their margin significantly without necessarily an awful lot of extra work. So this is where that connection between organic and fair under a coconut tree really struck me. You have to work on both if you want to be fair. And that's become the model on all of our projects. So we start doing the same in Ghana on palm oil and yeah. our partner project in Palestine, Canaan, Palestine, olive oil supplier. We, we just, just, started making them think about how to improve soil fertility, how to change practices. Had to be organic, but organic wasn't enough, right? You actually want to work on the soil. So we did this for a few years. We started doing the same in India, which is different. It's not tree crops, it's field crops. And there we were not all that, we didn't pay enough attention. We didn't run the project ourselves initially. But there the issue also was just to build the soil back up, which was completely depleted. It's flat land in Uttar Pradesh. There's no humus in the soil. Decades of just heavy nitrogen fertilization. Yeah. And we thought you can switch these people to organic, but you can't unless you provide an alternative, right? You need to, if you want people to stay away from fertilizer, you need to offer an alternative. We were not closely involved. 
So I, ultimately, that this project is an, didn't an go to exciting work. point you're making there, Gero. I'm gonna I'm gonna double tap on that because sure. you know the 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 storyline is not just the choice between organic and uh, pesticides. The, the storyline is also that the the you know agritox industry and the lobbying of that industry really deeply has incentivized farmers to choose that route, right? And so yep. on the other side to you know help somebody make the more educated choice which ultimately um, connects to the health of the soil and you know, the microbes and the yep. gut biome of all of the humans that eat from that soil. It, it, it takes this economic incentive as well because you're, you're up against the economic incentive on the other side. You, you are, but it's a, it's a devilish message that many farmers in the developing countries have just swallowed and taken it on to a point where in many countries now, like in Ghana, for instance, you know, we, we now start promoting mixed agroforestry in a situation where farmers you now plant oil palm and cocoa in mono crops. They're small, so you don't have big monocultures. But to get these farmers now to say, oh, I think your idea of a mixed cropping system is a good one. That's a lot of work. This is what people had done before. Then came the agro revolution, right? It got people into doing monocrops with just a lot of um, agrochemicals, fertilization and pest control and weed control mostly. And to, to just undo that, this is what we're up against. So there's not an awful lot of that indigenous knowledge anymore that people sometimes talk about. It, it, we find it in Samoa a little bit, but in most part of the world that is almost gone. So what we had to do is to re-educate and bring in these crazy Western concepts of again focusing on the soil rather than just on supplying nutrients and doing integrated pest control etc it's been a lot of work and this is where this is issue of training comes in mm -hmm. you need you know farmers are stubborn and slow to change their minds anywhere on the planet whether that's in bavaria or in india or so it's all the same yeah. and ultimately that's that's what we've been doing the last 10 12 years and then you know, after seven, eight years in the business, the term regenerative agriculture gradually emerged here in the United States because people started thinking organic isn't really what we thought it was. And that that David knew what we were doing on the ground and I knew and we thought, boy, we're in a pretty good position to actually to actually just talk about this a little bit because that's what we've been thinking. We didn't call it mm. regenerative agriculture. We didn't call it right, much. I mean, that's that's a buzzword that's birthed now because you know so many people are looking towards what is, what can I get behind that helps, you know, um, both the social uh, in injustice to, to become you know at some point um, a more just world, but also mm -hmm. like the the havoc that's been created to the environment. And David, for those who are watching the uh, the video episode, you're wearing a hat, which I believe is from your uh, cannabis brand called Sun Earth. Um, and I just want to mention the sun earth part. Maybe, maybe just, maybe we can just, you know, again, dive just a bit deeper on how that is. Yeah. That's really the simplistic message. It, it comes from the most indigenous and most uh, simple ways of understanding our interconnection between the sun as a life-giving force and the earth and the soil as our, our, you know, yeah, the backdrop for food. Yeah, so you know, I, you know, just as we're talking here, you know, we mentioned about Anamic and Steiner and his concept of a farm as a living organism, and you were talking about the the sun, the moon, and the soil, and you know, just really understanding the magical mystery of how this all interplays, and um, you know, that soil is a miraculous ecosystem, and when you feed it and take care of it, it'll feed and take care of us, and um, yeah, so on on sun and earth, that's. Um, uh, that's kind of the parallel to the regenerative organic certification in the cannabis space because of federal prohibition. Farmers, cannabis farmers can't access the organic program, USDA organic program, or regenerative organic or anything with the term organic. It's ridiculous. So, so Sun and Earth is basically kind of a sister program for cannabis. But it, you know, cannabis is so huge. I mean, it's almost bigger in total than the entire organic sector. I mean, counting the the non-organic cannabis. So, I mean, it was a real opportunity for, um, you know, to make a real impact and- um, and like re-education, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and actually the story here with cannabis farmers is pretty much a story around the world. And, you know, uh, 
you know, Gero mentioned Ghana and palm and cocoa. We're taking two of the world's most problematic crops, uh, you know, these huge palm plantations in Indonesia and Borneo that are just ripping up rainforest and disrupting communities and displacing farmers off their land. And they become plantation workers for, you know, slave wages. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's, you know, horribly destructive climate, you know, the, just oxidizing huge, huge amounts of carbon to the atmosphere. Um, and then cocoa, you know, Garrow's really been educating us, but just, you know, grown in these dense monocultures, very insecticide, uh, very insecticide intensive. Uh, child slavery is literally involved uh, in a lot because the way the, the prices that most chocolate manufacturers pay are just abysmal. And there's, you know, just a lot of pressure on these farmers to, you know, basically do unethical, unethical things. So we're, we're, we're showing like, hey, you can take these two problematic crops. And if you integrate them in these mixed ag forestry systems where you understand, you know, how the, how the canopies are going to fill in. So, that, you know, it's the right spacing of the planting and you're pruning and, 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 you know, taking care of things. And you got, you know, Kosovo as a kind of ground cover crop, maybe some bananas. Um, you're basically mimicking a natural ecosystem, which has that, you know, in a wild forest, you'll have you know, multi strata, you know, different heights of trees, bushes and ground cover, and that'll maximize photosynthetic capture in a way that a monoculture doesn't. And, you know, what we found is if you took those blocks, monoculture blocks of cocoa and palm and compared the productivity and yield compared to a, a mixed system, the mixed system is going to outproduce that that monoculture by a lot. Um, and you're, you know, you're, you're getting different levels of canopies and really maximizing that photosynthetic capture and biomass production and, and yields. Um, and, but yeah, so the story with cannabis is, is unfortunately, you know, all, all too similar to what every other commodity crop is, is uh, what their reality is, which is, you know, huge corporate industrial interests come in, yeah. to try to figure out how to farm for the, you know, cheapest, way, you know, uh, and externalize all the ecological and social impact. So we, we in California, I think it's like 3% of our energy is goes to power these huge indoor cannabis operations, which is ridiculous, you know, and, and wow, that's yeah, a massive chunk of the energy uh, production. Yeah, and there's no reason for it. I mean, cannabis should be grown under the sun in the soil, uh, you know, no chemicals with fair labor. I mean, that's, you know, and, and, and so this ecosystem of craft cannabis farmers are being displaced by these huge corporate industrial grows. So Sun and Earth is this consumer facing standard to help conscious cannabis consumers to pick medicine like you would pick your food or your clothes. Like, is it coming from an agricultural system that's, you know, rewarding farmers and communities and, you know, helping promote biodiversity and community health and, or is it a, you know, ecological catastrophe and, and yeah. social and ecological catastrophe. And that's really the choice. And you had said, like, just as conscious consumers, like we need to be making those choices and paying the premiums to make the kind of world we want to live in. Like, you know, understanding where our plates of farm and our forks of pitchfork and our knives of butchering, butchering knife or soldering knife, you know, just like, what are you, you know, what does your farm look like? You know, yeah. You I have a, I have a personal question that I want to throw in there to the two of you. And, and so, you know, you are these trailblazers, you, you are creating a company with this ethical standard and you're, you know, you're, you venturing out and showing others how to do it. How do you personally, both of you, um, and whoever wants to go first, choose optimism again and again and again in a world where it seems like sometimes you're up against these like um, weird structures that we've inherited from the past? You go first, David. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, I, I'm, you know, a cautious optimist, I guess. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, based on, let's just say, some very powerful psychedelic experiences of, um, understood that there is a deep love and light at the heart of reality and you know in the midst of all the suffering and absurdity so you know that it's like a real foundation um it's no guarantee that we're going to make it as a species you know or, or you know or, or get through this but i mean i feel like we have the answers in hand and it's just the willingness you know or do do we can we collectively you know manifest the policies and the behavior change to decarbonize our economy, you know, convert glo global agriculture to regenerative organic bases, and you know, just uh, you know, in every other way, make our world a you know peaceful, just, and you know, compassionate, sustainable place, you know, heaven on earth. So I, I think we can get there. You know, we just yeah, it's just a you know, obviously, it's generational. A careful of, optimist. 
but yeah, that's that's careful. that's awesome. I also know that you're on the on the board for um, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. So um, just just yeah, give ups have... for for that kind of work, you know, because it is what gives people this deep grounding, at least some people, um, into understanding that there's there's more than than profit and uh, identification with nation states. It's, I, I think it's that in, in, in part, right? And maybe then to, to add to David, I, I started psychedelics much earlier. I was never that extreme, but of course I find in retrospect, they have shaped my attitude. But I was also, you know, I grew up in the sixties, right? So I did think it was room to change the world. And I always looked around, what can you do? And I thought governments maybe should do this. I didn't like industry at all back then. I thought this is governments and NGO. And I came here to the US, started working for industry and environmental. And then I thought, okay, I understand industry, but it wasn't that inspiring. And it wasn't really until I, I met David and then started working with Dr. Bonds that I realized, hmm, what companies can do if they have the willingness to, they can act like guerrilla. I, I always refer to our word guerrilla style, why? because you ignore red tape, right? You have the determination, you sometimes need a little bit of cash and you need somewhat of a program and then you can change things. And you're asking about optimism. I'm, I see all the, all the dark sides on the planet all the time, right? So I spend usually when there's no Corona, I spend half of the year on the road visiting projects and you know what kind of trouble the developing world is in. This does not keep me from being an eternal optimist because as David says, you know, there's concepts. And what, what I really like about regeneration, we didn't really touch upon this, the, the prospect that turning agriculture actually into a sink, a carbon sink rather than a source, which it currently is, that just, I had completely overlooked that you can do this in agriculture. And that there's one driver. I just think, well, you, uh, climate change, I'm not saying it's not a problem. In fact, I will not see, I will not live to see the dip. I just know the world can do this. It's not a real big, it's just a matter of putting a mind to it. And this is what I love about the work with our projects. You, you know, those are companies that we co-own. So we actually set the tone and give direction. We leave management to local teams, but just Julian seeing those teams develop over the years. We had a couple of cases of fraud, and you mm -hmm. ultimately realize how important it is to build teams. And we've done a really nice job. And it's to see how people respond to this idea that you can use a business to create good. And that I don't mean in the sense of a, a Western company that's remote from the operating. We are on the, those are all companies, right? We run four companies in effect under somewhat difficult conditions with oftentimes no air conditioning, which doesn't matter, but it's really difficult because you face all the problems that you have in the developing world, but still you get stuff done with not so much money. All you need is a committed company that's willing to go out there, give me a lot of freedom, and then you just look at the condition and say, yeah, I think we need to do this, or oh, there's an interesting idea. You hire some German consultants, help you plant the forest, or there's just all kinds of really interesting capacities on the plan. That's where my optimism comes from, is yeah, that it's always a way. Yeah, there, there is, and it's about motivation, yeah. right? It's a motivating, competent people, and then it's leadership building. So we're, we're just doing all the stuff you do here in the United States. We do this on the ground, and it's so much fun. It's to develop teams and see that they are content with this vision, that it's very compatible, and you still need to beat up on the, be, not beat up on the farmers, but get farmers to change their ways. It's a lot of work. You, you have no mm -hmm. idea. But I think it's something that, you know, can go, can run downhill eventually. And then there's also the human experience. That, that's what I like most. It's just the interaction with people on the ground is what drives me. And that's maybe Thank what's missing yeah. in many other companies that they buy usually. We don't buy. We actually make this stuff ourselves and get involved in business and advice. And that's the fun part. I really enjoy this. And that's really where the vision of the branch is to see that mm -hmm. you do want clean raw materials and it takes a little bit to get there, but these are businesses, right? We sell to third parties. So one of our favorite customers is in Bavaria, right? There's Rapunzel, German company. So they buy palm mm -hmm. oil and coconut oil from us. Why? Because they like regenerative palm and coconut oil and they make noise about it, right? So it's kind of fun to even use these established organic networks to sell good products. And there is a market, yeah. it's small, but the story you get the project and that's where David and all the work with developing 
a new standard making noise. They even know regenerative in Bavaria now. Right? So it's kind of fun for us to go. This is an American word. And every time we go now, people start saying, oh, what's going on? And right, because you... humans and people want to group around that what works, right? Yeah. And so it's, it's been quite the, you said it, like rolling a stone up a hill yeah. uh, feeling, and especially for, for, for you both that are on the forefront of this. Um, but it's, it's an exciting time because yeah. you know, the other side of this coin or of this double-sided sword, or however you want to put the metaphor, is unfortunately that of destruction. And we've gone, you know, far enough into the great pollution age or, you know, the dark ages, yep. whatever we want to call it. That is like, it's, it's pretty plain obvious. And so at this point, there's, there's, there's only uh, that choice to make. And so I think there's, there's hundreds of millions of people ready, but as often they need help, they need support. I know that our time for this episode is coming slowly to a close. So I have one more question I want to ask the two of you um, and, and let's see where it goes. And it, you know, I always ask this question. In fact, this is the question that made me start Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast. And it's especially exciting to ask um, in a context where there is, you know, a family business that's been operating for over 150 years. Because the question is, again, to both of you, the question is, in a seven generational context, looking forward, where we are the ancestors of the future, what's your dream for this planet and for our species? David. Yeah. Um, yeah, that we're, uh, you know, producing all the goods and services in our economy uh, and for well-being in a, in a way that rewards everyone involved, the, the, the people, the animals, the, the land, the ecosystems, everyone's winning. Um, it's all, you know, self-regenerative. Um, you know, we've got our medicines, all the medicines are moving now and are, you know, widely, uh, utilized for the deep healing and insight that they can provide. Um, and yeah, you know, I just, when Gerald was saying that the secret ingredients to, to what we're doing, I mean, most of our partners, the, the local partners are, you know, they're so crucial, the right part, local partners in, in all these projects. And three of the four are Muslim led, which is awesome. And in our ethos of all one, you know, cross religious and ethnic divides, just understanding our common humanity and common divine source um and uh and yeah so you know just you know we're a little microcosm of what we hope to be see worldwide and you know it's not just us i mean there's many other companies that are doing rad stuff and you know we were inspired and hope to inspire others so yeah it's it, it's that that's the the vision and then on the on the ground and, and you know i'm super aware of the fact that economies of scale is what we've been putting our money on and they do work to some extent and certain things like petroleum are really difficult to do in small units so I and I've worked enough for for corporate America to know that there's a value to it so short term I'm just realistic to accept that there is big structures and what they're doing they're usually separate right the, the biggest problem is the separation the long supply chains that people don't see what the impact of their action is what we do is the opposite we go to the ground get involved and we're not, never going to cover 100 percent, right my dream is that we just set examples and that more and more people engage directly and that's just the way they do agriculture but it's also the way they interact with people and what, what i mentioned like this concept of leadership building it's a a word you can't use in Germany because of the leader thing, but it's mm -hmm. um, it, it just creating people that are willing to take on responsibility and act and actually have fun in the process. And you know, I'm, I'm on this um, internet-based project in, in in Germany. It's called Project Together, and there's just a hundred younger people mostly, and they want to change the world. It's funded. There's a there's a foundation behind it. And what they express is desire to collaborate for common good, right? So there's a huge human potential. The problem is the world has gotten so complicated that most people don't really know where they can interact. So my concept of a world is one where you get closer to the issues that need to be done. And also what I find is the best thing to do with people is to work, right? I, I don't really like just drinking coffee. Coffee is great, but I love getting friends involved in projects or with the guys on the ground figuring out what can you conspire to do next. So I just like just filling activities, business activities, more with meaning and purpose than it currently possible. So my, my vision 
is both on agriculture, renewables anyways, but it's also about a different way of interacting between humans where the hierarchy isn't as, as high as it used to be, that there's more respect, less hatred, um, less animosity towards people that look a little different. And that's, it's all fine, but how do you get there? I found that getting together and working on things is just a perfect way of doing this. You know, in Ghana, we've got a, we've got a mixed farmership Christians and Muslims, and it's just so much fun to have meetings. And in the beginning, you say a prayer and it, it rotates Muslim or Christian. Then there's often mayhem. They like arguing really noisily. And then in the end, there's amen. And I always join in the, the amen. And it's just, it's, I find this a really nice symbol, right? Is you get something done, you argue over things and it doesn't matter what you believe in so much. And th this is, that's the part of the world I, I look forward to, but it requires yeah. you create closer connections and that means also smaller units and medium-sized enterprises to me have become a perfect vehicle to do that. You mm -hmm. can just get stuff done without a lot of bureaucracy and you just act guerrilla style. That's that's my dream. You really are what I used thank, to dream of in the 70s. Yeah. Really cool. I prefer if this is actually done in a or, more organized fashion and fun way, organized by medium-sized enterprises. And I, many Germans start believing this way. It's kind of fun to watch. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. And it's especially fun to ask the two of you who are living that journey and walking that walk. I'm uh, super grateful for this episode today to have you both on to get a, a bit of the energy uh, feeling with you what, what's going what's going on at Dr. Bronner's and how, you know, as you said, the, the guerrilla medium sized business is, is, you know, trailblazing waves of change. So thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. And I, I just wanted to plug one more thing in, in Gerald's book here. I mean, we didn't get into it, even though we got two Germans and, uh, and a guy with German Jewish uh, soap making ancestry. But Gerald's book goes real deep in, in a really interesting way in our family's uh, history and lineage and you know, our German Jewish soap making family there. And you know, I'm fifth generation and, and Gerald's experience growing up in Germany and, and processing, you know, the whole you know, World War One and Two trauma and, and Holocaust trauma, and, and that's it's huge. really amazing. amazing. Maybe Gero, maybe we can do a one-on-one -on -one episode just on that and dig dig deeper if you want to, because I think it's the time of reconciliation on the planet, and so we're everyone has a, a different uh, inroad onto that topic, and so I, that's one that we share, right? I'll, I'll be I'll be glad to, and everything we talked about today finally is, is covered in that book it's really worth reading because it's just it's the the vision so it's not technically yeah, it's at all get the book. so you, you would relate to it so awesome. uh, honor thy label dr browner's unconventional journey to clean um green uh, supply right. chain is is the, the title and it'll be fun it'll be fun reading it and then we'll talk next time julian once, once you've had a chance to, to take a look huh? all Let's right do it